such a pleasure to be here with my not only my friend Pastor Quinn and, and Pastor Trevon. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for an opportunity to come and break bread with God's people. Turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you came this morning. Now turn to somebody else, act like you really mean it this time. Yeah. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here to break bread with God's people. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And His liberty's in this house. Can you say amen? amen. And so we're so glad to be here. Uh, my wife sends her apologies. She's sorry she could not be here. She wanted to be here. Uh, we, our weekend was divided in, in locations. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. And, and she wanted to be here. She said, be sure and send her love. And she will be here the next time. And she told me to really do good so we could get reinvited. So the pressure is on this morning. <laughs> Amen to go. I think you have some of the finest pastors anywhere in the country right here. And Pastor Trevon and Quinn. Love you, sir. We give honor to the Father God because he is God. And to the Son Jesus who is the Redeemer. And without him we have no plan of redemption whatsoever. And to the Holy Spirit who is the Comforter and the Illuminator of God's Word to us. And to your pastors whom God has set in order. We're thankful that God chooses us and places us in his presence and in the position that he, prov that he wants us to be in. Can you say amen to that? Some time ago I was sitting in my office and uh, I, I have a, what I call a daily thing that I do. I get up in the mornings and, and uh, um, not necessarily have to do it in this order, but I make sure I have coffee. And uh, go to my office. And sitting in my office, I do a daily devotion that I, that I do that is something that the Lord has placed in my heart. And I pray for people. I pray for Hope Cathedral every day. Pray for your pastors. And that God will strengthen them and, and encourage them. And uh, I, I, I love that time of, of uh, fellowship with the Lord and, and being able to pray and communicate with Him. I opened my Bible. And uh, as it was laying there just in, in, in study and making preparations, it opened to a passage of scripture I'm going to give you in just a moment. We're going to make a few brief comments on it and ask the Lord to quicken it to our lives and to our hearts. Uh, I looked at my, uh, my library. It's not a vast library. It's a, it's a good sized library. I have uh, books that date back to the 1800s on, on the Gospels and Bibles. I have Bibles uh, from uh, so many different languages uh, none that I can read, and, uh, but I love them. They were, they were gifts, and, and I'm so thankful for them. But I opened up my Bible and fell on the scripture that we're going to share in the next three hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> but I promise to be brief no matter how long it takes me. So. But uh, I'm thankful. The one prayer that I have is that I never let the Word of God become commonplace, that it is always impact into my life. I've discovered that it has changed not only my history, but it's changed my future. Changed not only my history, but it has changed my future. It changed my history in that what was supposed to be because of my history was changed because God changed my future. He gave me a future out of my past. He took what was and made it something new in Christ Jesus. And for that, I'm thankful this morning. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the grace of God. Neither would you. I mean, God, if he wanted to, he could have picked somebody else, but he picked us to be here this morning. And I'm glad for that. Can you say amen? And, and so in my prayers in the, in the uh, morning hour, I just enjoy, I've, I shut my door. My wife has a, uh, an office at the other end of the house, which she's grateful for. And because uh, I like to, it, it just I, I, when I see something, I like to get excited about it, and, and it churns in my spirit. And and when I opened the scripture that we're going to share in just a moment, I was just excited about it because I'd read it more times than I count. I've read through the Bible um, multiple times, but something stood out, something grasped me, and it got into my spirit. I st pushed back my chair from my desk, and I stood up and began to praise God, begin to thank God that. Uh, that nothing had become mundane or commonplace, but that his word was a quickening spirit to change me. 
And I get, I get a little loud in my office sometimes, and I, I had my, my blinds of my office open where the sun could shine in, and I was just worshiping God and thanking God and, and thanking Him for the excitement. And I looked out, and there was a couple passing by, and I could see as they passed them by with the dog, I could see they could hear something, but they couldn't distinguish exactly what it was. And I realized they were hearing my voice from my house. And so I stopped for just a moment and then shouted to the top of my voice, this is God speaking. I noticed they haven't been back by very much lately. But uh, um, it, it, it was a ex- wonderful experience. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Anytime you see the word behold in the Bible, in anywhere in the New Testament or even in the Old, anytime you see the word behold, it's a command to pay close attention because what's going to follow is of significance. It's, it's an imperative, it's important, and you need to grasp it. And so John the Revelator is on the Isle of Patmos. He's been uh, uh, quarantined there, as it were. He's been rejected. He's been put there. But the Bible says he's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And while he's there, he hears this voice that tells him, Behold. And so John, the revelator, writes what he hears, and he writes it down because it catches his attention as it did me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Read this scripture more times than I can even remember. I couldn't even begin to count them. But it had significance on this day. I recalled my mother having a picture in her house. Uh, It was actually an old calendar that had long since faded. The numbers were uh, had been taken off. The the months had been removed, but the picture remained. It was a picture of Jesus as the uh, as the shepherd with his cane, and he's knocking on the door of a of a house. I remember my mother said to me on occasion, "Leo, what do you see?" And I said, I see a, a guy that looks like a shepherd. He's standing at the door. I knew, who, I knew it was Jesus, so I understood that part. I said, he's knocking on the door. And she said, that's, that's right. And then she said to me again, Leo, what is it that you really see? I guess for the first time as a young man, I, I really looked at the picture very carefully. And I noticed something I'd never seen before. There was not a handle on the outside. The handle was on the inside. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. I realized for the first time what the reference was. John is just simply saying that that what God is saying to him, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice. And I I paused because it gave me great consternation. I, I was trying to collectively pull my thoughts together and understand this. Because I'm beginning to have something unfold in my, in my heart that I, that I knew, but it was, was impacting this time as never before. I saw something I'd never seen before. It, it, was, it was almost overwhelming. And I got to begin to think about this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm thinking, this is an amazing story. It's, it's a powerful story. It's a, but it's not a story. It's a statement. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And because of the word behold, I need to look at this carefully. I need to have a greater perception of what's taking place. I need real clarity on this. I need to understand it in its fullness. And as it began to unfold to me, I began to see something I'd never seen before. The Bible talks about in the New Testament that Jesus is God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God, the Bible said the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Jesus. And I remember John the Baptist, reading about John the Baptist, who was uh, uh, the cousin of Jesus, born six months prior to Jesus. He's the, he's the, uh, uh, the way maker. He's making a way for Jesus. And, and they're cousins. They've been their family. 
But on one occasion, John looks up and he sees Jesus coming down the road, coming down to the Jordan. And, and uh, jo- Jesus says, I'm, I want you to baptize me. And suddenly, when John sees Jesus, Jesus ceases to be his cousin. And he makes the statement, Behold, the Lamb of Zion that taketh away the sins of the world. Suddenly, G- uh, John saw Jesus differently than he'd ever seen him before. He was not just his cousin now. He was not just a relative. He was not just a part of the family. This was the Lamb of Zion and take away the sins of the world. This, this was God incarnate. And John the Revelator is recognizing this probably for the very first time even though he understood the prophecies. Think about that just a minute. That God sent an angel and, and to Mary and to Joseph and said to Mary, Mary, don't worry about this. What is conceived in you is conceived of the Holy Ghost. This is a God conception. This is, this is a God creation inside you. Don't worry. This is, this is Messiah. This is Mashiach. This is the prophecies are being fulfilled. That's an overwhelming thing to have happen. It's an overwhelming thing. My mind was ushered back to the book of Exodus, the 25th chapter and the 8th verse, where where God is simply saying, I will let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. I will let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The word sanctuary is from the old Hebrew word mikdash. It means I will let them make me a physical structure. I'm going to let them make me a house. And then he says that I may dwell among them. The word among is from a Hebrew word called mishkan. It's where we get the word shekinah, shekinah glory. It's mishkan. The word mishkan means this, simply in the original language. I will let them build me a physical structure. They can build me a house, but someday I'm going to dwell not among them, but in them. In them. So God is doing something here to John on the Isle of Patmos. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open up, I will let come in and he with me. This is God incarnate. Think about that just a moment. The holy God of heaven, the holy God of the universe, the God that formed man from the dust of the earth, the God that breathed within his nostrils the breath. The, the, the Nishima of God, the, the life of God, breathed within his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living thing just like God. Every time I read Genesis 2 7, I, I'm once again overwhelmed after 54 years. I started my 54th year this past July, and every time I read Genesis 2 7, and the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed within his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then when you study it from the original language, it comes across like this. And Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah means covenant deity. And Elohim means creative deity. And Jehovah Elohim formed man from the minute particles of the totality of deity. And breathed within his nostrils that part of himself. And man became a living thing just like God. You ought to shout in this house. You were not made from some kind of uh, primordial ooze. You were not made from some kind of amoeba that came together by accident. You weren't made because the the cosmos got out of kelter with each other and had a big crash. You were made divinely conceived. You were formed by God's own hand. You were not formed by an angel as great as Michael and Gabriel are. They were not the ones that formed you. God took you. He made you from the very being of himself and made you what you are today. God loves you. I'm amazed when I think of that. I don't want to lose that wonder. I don't believe that God uh, made man as a Disneyland effect. I don't believe he sprinkled some stardust out here and man kind of came together in a Disneyland kind of uh, 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 cohesion there. I believe that God took a cell, one cell. I believe God took one cell and he began to inscribe in that. uh, Scientists tell us today that within every single cell of your body there's over three billion bits of information and God put the the, the distinctiveness in that cell and then in the middle of that cell he put that part of himself that the devil can't take out he put that God part of himself inside you and he formed man the Bible says that God made man from the the totality of deity let me show you what he did he reached inside of himself pulled out God material and made you who you are 
and you wonder why the devil hates you. He hates you because down in the deep recesses of who you are, down in the core of your being, there's a piece of God in you that he can't destroy. There's a piece of the divine nature of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that lays down deep inside you. And the devil doesn't want you to ever figure that out because if you ever figure that out, you'll be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, heirs of God and join heirs with Jesus Christ. You can never be the same again. John the Bab- John and the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos. He looks up into the heavens and he hears this voice. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, I'll come in and sup with him. It is divinity personified. It is the Godhead in its entirety. It is, it is Emmanuel, God with us. It is, it is Shalom, the God of peace. It is, it is of all the names of God rolled into one. He's standing at your door asking access to your heart knocking at your door this God who made the ground you stand on this God who made the stars in the heavens that you look up in the night and see this God who formed the sun and put it up there and made the moon the lesser light this God who pulled the mountains up and made the valleys this God who spoke into existence and the fish of the sea came into life he spoke and the lands were created everything he made. This God stands at your door knocking and asking to come in. He does not have to. He didn't have to ask. He didn't have to knock. If he wanted to, he could come in. He's king of kings. He's lord of lords. But no, he stands at your door with all the ugliness on the inside. I know what you've been through. I've been through that thing, same thing. When the ugliness of my past, when the, the life that I was living was not pleasing to him, and yet he's standing at my door knocking, knocking at my door. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to wait for me to answer, but he wanted me to ask him to come in. This God of the universe, he could push the door down if he wanted to. He could disintegrate your house, but he doesn't do that. He stands at your heart's door asking to you let him in. Turn to somebody and say, let him in. This God. This God of the universe. I'm sitting in my office and I'm looking at this God, the King of Kings, the, the Emmanuel, the, 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 the great Messiah, the Lamb of God. He doesn't have to knock at my door. He could take and make ten more planets just like this if he wanted to. All he had to do was speak the word only. The Bible says, and my servant shall be healed, said one man. But Jesus stands at your door and he knocks at your door waiting for you to let him in. Waiting for you to let him in. Turn to some side of the body and say, let, let Jesus in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open up, I'll come in and sup with him. I, I, I don't know about you. When you became a Christian, you were probably uh, really holy and righteous and probably had everything pretty cleaned up. But when Jesus knocked on my door, it was a mess. There was no way I wanted to let him in. I said, I, I said Jesus, if you'll wait just a minute, I need to straighten up some things. Just give me a moment to push some of the, 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 the books aside and the magazines aside. Just, just give me a moment to turn off the television, God. Just, just give me a moment to turn down the radio. And, and God, just, just give me a moment. I want to clean up the kitchen. But God's not waiting for you to clean up your kitchen. He's not waiting for you to clean up your bedroom or to clean up your living room. All he wants to do, he's let me in. I'm knocking at your door. Just open up. Let me in. And if you'll do that, if you'll do that, I'll change everything about you. I'll change it by coming into your life and making a new creature out of you. I don't know how that blesses you, but that blesses me. Listen. <clears throat> he said, I- I'll come in. I-, I-, I, remember, I remember the story I'll never forget many years ago uh, of a-, a lady who worked for a-, a wealthy woman for many, many years and, and the-, the-, the lady passed away. And so the pastor came by to the lady who had worked for the wealthy woman for a long time. He came by and he just wanted to check on her, make sure she was okay. And, and she said, Pastor, I- I'm doing good. And, he- and-, and he- she said to him, Pastor, let me go fix us a-, a-, a cup of tea if you don't mind. And he said, fine. And so she went into the kitchen and began 
begin to make some tea and he began to look at the pictures on her wall, the pictures of the family and relatives and, and, um, and he saw a, a number of pictures there and he, and he took off his glasses and, and cleaned them and, and looked again about the time she was coming in and, and uh, he, he said to her, I said, ma'am, do you, uh, these pictures, are you your family and friends? And she said, yes, that's family and friends. He said, what about this, this one plaque on the wall here? What is that? The lady looked at him and said, Pastor, I, I, that was from the lady I'd worked for. She, she wanted me to have that, uh, it, it, and she, it was a gift for me. And so, so he, she gave it to me. He says, have you ever read what the plaque says? She said, no, Pastor, almost embarrassed. She says, I never learned to read. And the pastor looked at her and said, this is the title deed for everything the woman owned that you work for, hanging on your wall. How many of us have the title deed laying in front of us on our book stands and on our coffee tables? It's the title deed to everything God said you had. He gave it to you. He's knocking at your door trying to give you something. Knocking at your door trying to give you something. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open up, I'll come in and sup with him. And Jesus makes the statement. He, he wants to come in. What was he wanted to come in? He, he wants to come in with your dilapidated, run-down condition of your life. And he says, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. I want to come in. Now I want to live here. Now I want to live here. I, I thought to myself, no, he, he wouldn't want to live his house. I, I know this house too well. I, I know how it is. I know how run down it was. And Jesus said, that's all right. I'm an architect. I'm an architect. As a matter of fact, when I was born to this world, I was a carpenter's son. I can change this thing. He says, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to leave it the way it was. I'm going to make a new creation out of it. I'm not going to just renovate it. I'm going to tear the inside out and make it a brand new you. Because if you let him on the inside, he's going to change everything about you. Turn to somebody and say, it's time to change. And then, and then he says this, but here's what I want you to do. I, I know you've had, some, you've had some indebtedness. I know that you're so far in the, in the, in, in the red that you're just ain't never going to see the light of day. I want to help you. So here's what I wanted to do. I want to buy all the property. I, I paid for it already. I went to all your debtors and I've paid the debt off. But I want you to sign the title deed over to me. And, and, and you, you sign the title deed over to him. He, he becomes the owner of your house. And he says, I'm going to build you a new house on the inside. And you, you can live there as long as you want. And then when you die, i got another house for you on the other side. So you live in a brand new house. What does that mean? It means this. The next time the devil comes to collect on a debt from your house. The next time the enemy comes to your door trying to collect on a debt you couldn't pay. And, and Jesus is there in your house. You tell the devil, I, I, excuse me just a minute, Satan. I, I don't own this house anymore. Let me introduce you to the new owner of the facility. Let me introduce you to the person who owns it now. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice, let him open up. I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. You can relax in your house now because Jesus can get the door. I said, Jesus can get the door. I don't know what you're looking for in your life, but I want Jesus to own this house. I've owned it long enough. I, I've discovered right from the very beginning, I'm not a very good carpenter. I, I'm not a very good handyman around the house. My, my wife will ask me to do something, and by the time we get done, we need a plumber. My daddy was a handyman. That way he could have had a knack at that. I couldn't do it. And boy, nobody wants me to work on their cars. I, I've tried to help people once in a while. And I said, where's the carburetor? They said, we don't have one anymore. I, I don't know much about cars or, 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 or plumbing. And, and I've never been a good roofer. But i tell you what, I know somebody who can fix the house. I said, I know somebody who can take care of all the intricacies of your home. His name is Jesus. His name is Emmanuel. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Turn the property over to somebody who can manage it. Give it to him and he will take care of it. He's the Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open up, I'll come in and, him, and sup with him and he with me. You see, I, I never forget the, the old, the old uh, uh, rabbi, Je, Je, uh, Judah HaLevite, made the statement. He said, I went out to run and find my God and found him running after me. Chasing after me, chasing after me. 
I'll never forget the three men in 2007, three men, one from Taiwan, one from the United States, and one from Canada. They ran over 4,000 miles. They, they ran a, 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 a equivalent to two marathons every day. It took them four months to cross the Sahara Desert and six countries. They braved every kind of condition that you can imagine. Had all kinds of in injuries. But they, they, they ended up by the Red Sea. They ran all that distance just to do one thing. Is to dip their hands down in the Red Sea and pull up the water out of the Red Sea. They ran across six countries. They ran uh, for four months. They ran every day of their lives for four months just to dip their hand in the Red Sea. And I've got some news for you. Jesus came across the galaxies and the universe. He came came from every corner of the cosmic uh, 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 universe that is in existence. And he came. This Jesus who created all these things came. And he landed at your door. And he's knocking to come in. Why would you dare hesitate to let him come in? He came through the eons of time. He came through thousands and millions of, uh, of, of cosmic years. And he stands at your door this morning and say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I challenge you just one time to let him come Come in and he'll change everything about your life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice and let him in. I'll come in and sup with him. Jesus is knocking at the door. Let him in. Turn to somebody and say, let him in. So that the next time sickness knocks at your door, you don't have to answer it. You just say, Jesus, get the door. The next time the devil comes to knock at your door to collect on a debt you it was already paid for, just say, Jesus, you get the door. And then hang a sign out in your front yard, no trespassing. This means you. Make up your mind to let him in. Make up your mind to let Jesus in. If you'll let him in, let him take over, let him take control, he'll change everything about your life. Can you say amen? Stand with me across, all across this room. Stand with your feet, please. The God of the universe, the God of all creation, standing here in this room today with you. All he wants is you to open the door and let him in. Trust me when I tell you, he'll change everything about you. I remember as a, as a young man coming up, my father was an alcoholic from the time he was 15 till in his 30s dying of cancer of the stomach when doctors gave him up to die. Jesus came into his hospital room and saved his soul and healed his body made a new creature out of him I remember my grandfather who was an alcoholic I remember me, them telling me about my great grandfather who was an alcoholic three generations of alcohols alcoholic three generations of people who had been cursed by the devil I, I heard people say well you know Leo's just like the Price family he's just like, just like his dad just like his granddad he's going to be just like that but I met somebody that could change history. I met somebody that could change my history. I met somebody that could change everything about me. And when he came into my life, he changed what was. The history didn't make any difference to him. When people, I mean, people would have been right. If they had known Jesus was coming in, they'd have said to Jesus, don't, don't, go, don't go in there. He's, he's not worth it. But Jesus says, if he'll let me in, I'll make him worth it. And so he stands at your door and knocking. Everything that you've encountered in your life, everything that has beat you down and beat you up, and what the devil's tried to beat you out of, God said, I'll, I'll restore it. I'll change it about you and make something brand new in your life. Can you say amen to that? Will you reach over and take somebody's hand beside you all across this room? All across this room? I want to lead you in a prayer. I want to lead you in a prayer. It's the most unselfish Christian prayer that we could probably make. But if you'll say it with me. I want you to pray it out loud where you can hear yourself pray it. I want you to say it so you can hear yourself utter those words. And so they can be indelibly printed on your memory banks. Say this with me. Pray this out loud together with me. Say this. Say, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, I thank you today for your goodness and your grace. But right now, I'm not asking for myself. I'm not asking for anything. But the hand I'm holding, whatever their need is, you bless them. Whatever the condition they're in, you bless them, God. 
use me as a conduit to bless them not asking for myself but the hand I'm holding bless them coming in and going out everything their hands touch bless them God heal their body bless them prosper them and lift them up it's not about me but it is about them so in the name of Jesus I bless them use me to be a blessing in Jesus name amen and amen somebody give him praise in the house somebody give him praise in the house